It is the Anfield Wrap, hosted by Neil Atkinson, joined by Neil Jones, Paddy Fitzsimons and John Gibbons to talk through Liverpool A, being top of the league, B, beating Brighton and C, what happens from here. Uh, But we are brought to you by Green King Sport, where football is more than a game. The season is entering the business end. They've written that down here for us, John, uh, as if we wouldn't know. Uh, I've never (laughs) known as much business end in my life and Green King Sport venues are showing every single televised Liverpool fixture, which is all of them, over the running. Uh, with more than 900 sports pubs across the UK it doesn't matter where you're based you can get every single minute of the action Uh, always be social around the football so if you can't get to the ground this month uh, get in the group chat sort it out and get down to your local Green King sports venue to get the game uh, and go from there you can get the app there's competitions discounts and there's content as well on Green King social platforms Uh, they should get us back on at this point and I'll tell them all about the business end Uh, (laughs) if they want to do that on the Instagram we can go from there because this is the business end Neil Jones We did a lot of shows, obviously, in the run-up to the game against Manchester City. That now feels, well, it is three weeks ago. It feels like an age ago. But what we wanted was what we've got now. I think that that's why... I understood why people were really peppy about the game against City, one we need to win. I understood why people came to that conclusion. But it always felt as though if Liverpool could just get out of that one without a defeat, the way the league table looks right now was eminently possible, and the league table looks great. Yeah, definitely. Um, I thought that, I mean, I, I had a few discussions with people about whether a point was, was a good result after it and I know why people were sort of could have had more you know probably should have had more in the second half but I thought I thought it was a good result at the time because of that game in the back pocket and a few other games as well that are coming up you know you, you sort of you start looking now and I think what you're seeing from City and Arsenal is they're not I, I don't I, I think Liverpool are the best of the three at the moment I think they're the best the best equipped team of the three and I think now the position they've put themselves in, I know we keep saying it, and you, you keep saying it, you know, the next game's the biggest game of our lives, but I just think these next two, I think if Liverpool come out of them, I think if they get six, I think I think they'll win the league. And I, I, I've thought it, I thought they've had a chance, but I think now if they can get out of this week with, with, with six more, I think it's not just a chance, I think it's strong favourites. It just opened up. Um, John, it was really interesting watching it with, with watching the second game with people yesterday because one of the reasons why was there was a lot of chat of what's the best result for Liverpool and all of that sort of stuff and then the league table just flashed up on 75 minutes and it was like a, a group experiment we'll <laughs> tell you what the best result is here for Liverpool and it's that the league table looks like this that was the one and it has just just opened a little bit you can still have your if buts and maybe City second half what happens with Van Dijk and Allison? go all the way back to Luis Diaz and Tottenham if you want you can still have that in the back of your mind but the truth of it is what we now see looks fabulous yeah exactly and listen we could have had more points but what we have is more than everyone else and so <laughs> so that's great isn't it and you're in a great position and you know I was doing what I think we've all done this morning had another look at the league table and you're looking at it and that, that three points to City and you're thinking if we win eight and draw one it doesn't matter what they do and and that's not a great position for them to be in, you know. Thinking well, we could win every game, and if and if Liverpool win eight, draw one, which we, which we've done in the past, you know, we needed it last season and we weren't very good. Um, you know, I think it was seven and two, seven wasn't and it two last and year? And Southampton's a bit mad. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they would have won that game if they needed to. And so so really, we just need to do what we did last season when we were sort of cobbled together and you know not enjoying ourselves very much. And and, and they win it, and that's a brilliant position to be in. That's a brilliant. You know, you'd have snapped anyone's hand off, snapped all the hands in the world off for. Um, for, for, for that in, in the summer and, and they've earned it they've earned it from hard work they've earned it from believing in each other they've earned, you know the, the whole squad has contributed to, to where we are now and listen it's going to take some wrestling off us is, is what I would say do you know what I mean you're not guaranteed to win it I had a little look at the odds this morning and we're 5 to 4 which is some of the favourites favourites now yeah. yeah yeah. so we're 5 to 4 but the bookies are saying it's, it's marginally more likely we won't win it than, than what we will which I think is about right but but it's going to take some wrestling off Liverpool. The uh, the captain in his program notes yesterday, uh, Paddy in his role as greatest living human, <laughs> um, th- throws open. Uh, he says, "Blood, sweat, and tears is what brought us to this point. Blood, sweat, and tears, and that's what we're going to have to do and do more of." And that looks to me to be the attitude. You know, it looks to be the attitude that 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 permeates the whole thing. The next two, as Neil Jones says, are absolutely massive. But I think. I think the bedded in. It was the first thing that Trent talked about when he had the opportunity on the telly title running, title running. It was like they were trying to get him to talk about something else. And he was like, yeah. I just want to talk about the title, to be honest with you. <laughs> I want to get back to be part of the title. Um, it looks to me like it's become 
over the course of the campaign and now nailed on the forefront of all of those players' minds led by the captain? Yeah, I think what, when, when he talks about blood, sweat and tears, I think what they've had to do to put themselves in this position should never be underestimated. You know, what they've, you know there's an argument that it, it, it can't get any harder than what it's been for the, the last few months, especially since, since Christmas, really. So With the injuries and all that, yeah. yeah. the injuries, ev- ev- everything else. And, and even the fixtures, the way some of the games have gone, the fact go, that, going the down. The fact that the manager's leaving as well, you yeah, know, like yeah. the, the, the narrative around it. And I just think as well, I think, I think now with, with, with nine to go, I just think I, th- I think they'll all look at it and think, you know, it, it can't get harder from what we've been through. And, you know, we've really just got to, we've got to push on and go for this now. I don't think they get many other games than what they had yesterday. I think I think they can I think they can take a lot a lot from that and coming through that in terms of blood, sweat and tears. I think you know you you look at that fix and you think you know Brighton will be a tricky game, but in terms of how much graft it was yesterday, I think there'll be few there'll be few sides who caused them that many problems, especially at home. Um, so to come through that now and, and you talk about the league table, even John there talking about eight wins and one draw, that's obviously providing the others win most of theirs, probably eight of theirs. I think Arsenal have to win there or. Or even more so, and I think that results on City, that three points on City, I think is the one that you've really got to look at and think. You know, I, I would be surprised if City finished third out of the three. So if you've got a result on them now and we're top, I think you're looking at that and thinking, you know, we've got a little bit of wiggle room there. I wouldn't be shocked if they don't need it. I could, I could see Liverpool going and winning all nine. You know, they have done it before, eighteen, nineteen. They, they have to win. What is it? Eight, like eight of the last, eight last games or nine of them. Um, they definitely can do it now, and I think that sort of laser focus, which they've never, ne- they've never really had in terms of having the lead. Uh, I think they'll really benefit us. When you talk about how hard the game was, Paddy, I thought it was noticeable to almost skip to the end. I thought both sides looked goosed on 80. Absolutely <laughs> knackered. I thought both sets of players looked like, God, we've been in one here. And, you know, it was interesting. Like, even I felt like I felt like Lallana came on and was almost yeah. annoying his teammates with his with his freshness. Why aren't you all pressing with me? And they were like, we've, 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 we've done this. And I felt like there was, a, there was a couple of elements of that as was wearing through. I think you can focus a lot on Liverpool and it's right too. But I thought, and we will do, but first and foremost, Brighton are a very, very good side, very well set up. But also, secondly, as I say, I think that both players, both sets of players, looked like this was this was one hell of a game when you got to 80, 85 minutes that we played through here. Yeah, I, th- I, th- I think even more than physically, I think mentally, when yeah. you play a side like that, I always think it's mad on the ground, especially like in a, in a title race in a big game like that when everyone's going a bit mad. And I, un- I understand like emotion takes over, but I think sometimes you got to stop and think. Imagine playing in this game. Yeah. <laughs> if you yeah. ever played a game of footy, imagine playing this game. Like some of the things they do, like there, there was a point I think twenty five minutes in, and I, I, was, I was wondering how we were playing and things. I had to take myself back to that game in October away at their place, which I mean I didn't go to the game, so I watched it on the telly. And I think it was easier watching that on telly in terms of seeing what what both sides were doing. But it was essentially like a centre half would come out and put the foot on the ball, and just it was like cat and mouse. They wait for the press, and as soon as they pressed, it was two passes, and you were, you were on the edge of the opposite team's box. And it, and it was like that again in Anfield, but in the you know the the, the occasion of Anfield and then people losing their minds and things. And I think I think more than anything mentally draining. I think yesterday on the players, the, the level of concentration Liverpool will have to put in there uh, to stay that focused, especially towards the end of the game. And you know there, there was a couple of, there was a couple of bad decisions going forward. I thought the last ten minutes in terms of our players, but I think you've got to forgive them for that. Like, it is what, what what do you do? You know you, 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 there's only a goal in it. You're desperate to get another one and kill it off, but. You know, so there was a few questionable decisions around the penalty area, but I think you've got to let them off for that. You know, to, to come through it in the end, it was uh, yeah. Good. Uh, Neil, a Brighton a unique challenge, or does Liverpool make them one? Because I think there's a thing where we're conscious now, I haven't had enough of it, that if we do what we normally do, listen, it might work, but if it doesn't, then we can we can find ourselves wide open. So there's this thing where they define the game more than we do, but as Patty says, there, there's stuff going on all over the pitch yeah. where we're tempting them, they're tempting us. Everyone's laying little traps for each other. But as as Paddy then says, if you get anything wrong, it can be as simple as ping, 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 and you're in trouble. Or alternatively, you don't see the ball again for 90 seconds. Yeah. And it's either of those two things that I think must just mentally exhaust. Players on both sides, there's so much going on all the time. Yeah, I think I think it's a good style contrast. I think Liverpool and Brighton, I think it's a good you know boxing sort of reference, but styles make fights. Don't yeah. I, think I, I think they're a good matchup for Liverpool in terms of... And probably City as well. Yeah. I think I think they prefer that they wouldn't want to play Arsenal. I think I think they 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 don't like Arsenal's kind of patience and sort of robustness, I suppose. Um, but I think Liverpool are a good little match for them. But they've got Arsenal on Saturday, haven't they? R five at their place. So you think? I was what I was thinking that as that game was going on, I was thinking, oh, these are good. Hey, they've got Arsenal next week. You know that sort of gives you a little bit of a, a, a we go? help as well. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. A little overnight, uh, just yeah, just just throwing it you, out there. You could get a show on, couldn't you? Darling, <laughs> yeah, easy, easy, <laughs> easy. Um, on tour again. But, um, yeah, they, um, 
I think I think they're I think they're a very good side. I, what I think the big thing about them is they've got real confident footballers all yeah. across the pitch. So I watched Newcastle v West Ham, and it was a really good game, four three. I was on Saturday, but there's four or five players on the pitch where you think Dan Bain, for example, you go well play on him. I don't think there's anyone in the Brighton team. Maybe the only one I would probably say would be the goalie. Mm. In, and he and he's he's pretty good, but you think who, who would you sort of who would you identify as the sort of guy to go and to go and win it off? Good bad heck, isn't he? Yeah, there's no there's no. Such I mean, you know, you look at a Dinger, what a, what a, what a talent he looks. You know, I saw him in the Afcon, and I thought, well, yeah, I forgot he played for Brighton. And you know, he was really good at, in the first game, wasn't he, against Liverpool? I thought he was really good yesterday. I think Welbeck's like one of them players that I don't. I think I think he's so underrated as a player, Welbeck. But, but then I also look and go, well, he doesn't score that many goals, but he seems to score an unbelievable one. You just look around the pitch, gross, like what an underrated player he is, and you think, I, I, I tell you what, I wouldn't like to play five a side against them. You know, like I, I think I think they'd make you look silly. So they're, they're just a good side. But I think with Liverpool's way, with Liverpool being so wedded to their idea of right, we're gonna we're gonna do it our way. I think it does maybe make an interesting contrast with with Brighton. There's there's a little thing in the early goal though, John, and I quite like them to stop. If we could <laughs> just not do that anymore, that'd be great. And that's part of why it goes nervy. But also, if you do take it out the equation, I think that the game state repeatedly just becomes much easier for Liverpool and it puts more pressure on Brighton. I thought it was noticeable, for instance, their best period, I think, in the whole game is the 15 minutes after the equaliser. Brighton in terms of playing progressive football. But Liverpool are good up until the equaliser. You know, they are creating chance after chance. So you're in this sort of double. I think Liverpool almost needed a bit of a breather because they'd gone up a gear. But the, my, part of my point here would be, lads, you'd make it easier for yourselves if you didn't concede in the first place after two minutes. Well, that's it. Well, it's the it's the seventh time this season that Liverpool have come from behind to win, which is brilliant. And I saw that stat before um, up to Joe put it out, so I retweeted it. And then someone come back to me saying, yeah, it'd be good if they stopped conceding early, <laughs> though, wouldn't it? And I was like, well, yeah, fair enough. Do you know what I mean? Both are true. Do, do you think, though, in a, in a situation like that, I know it's a, it sounds a ridiculous thing to say. Do you think it almost suits Liverpool a bit more to actually to not have this kind of pressure of can we get the breakthrough? So that right, we've got to we've got to go and, we've got to go and chase. So you can we've got to go and sort of get an equaliser as opposed to having it nil nil for an hour and you sort of like oh can we find a way through or do you lose do you lose your way? At least it just focuses them into like right we've 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 done it again lads you know like let's just go and get out. I don't know I think I think they've they've shown they can play both ways. I I feel like Liverpool's ideal this season in a funny way is to be nil nil on thirty and our best performances of the season many of them many of our wins we we've we've felt our way into games I've always felt so we've. You know, we, we've looked to control it, we've looked to grow into it, we've looked to almost work the opposition out, and then we've scored a goal just before half-time, and then we've scored one just after, and then we've mm. gone on to win. I think that's the that's almost the prototype of Liverpool performance for me this season, is that not much happens in the first 30, and then they, they have a really good 30 to 45, they, they, they play well in that period, and then and then they come out second half well, and then they, and then they effectively yeah. win the game. I think that's how they want to play. The problem is there's an opposition who, who, who want to do something different. <laughs> Got other ideas. Yeah, basically, yeah. So so they were like, well, you want nil nil on thirty, but 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 unlucky. Do you know what I mean? We're, we're going to come out, and so I think teams are onto it. I personally don't think the game at the weekend was a million miles away from the one at Old Trafford. To be honest with you, I think the difference is is that you know United take you know take chances, and but I think from from how Liverpool. Um, approached it and how Liverpool played. I don't think it's a, it's a million miles away, really. And, and listen, Liverpool could have won that game at Old Trafford quite easily, you know, if we'd have taken our chances, or if 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 they had just had a different day, um, you know, because obviously they get the equaliser late and stuff like that. But that one, you know, for all I thought Liverpool played well, you know, that one where Brighton they go through at the end and it goes past the post. I'm thinking Lallana, of the wasn't yeah, was it Lallana? Yeah, um, I was thinking that was um, you know, similar to. to you know, 118 minutes, and it's a similar thing, and and it, and it just that one creeps in, and this one creeps wide, and so I think the similarities are there. So I think this is I'm not saying I'm, I'm terribly worried about Liverpool, but I think you know it shows that if you don't take your chances, and Salah has 12, doesn't he? And and of course, if you don't take your chances, you're giving someone, a, you know, a, 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 a yeah. puncher's chance of it ever not help blow. And I think you know we we gave that to united and 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 that's how they hang in games as as we saw again at the weekend and, and we sort of gave it a little bit to brighton as well so we just need to be a little bit careful there i think yeah i think it's sort of a, it's like a strength and a weakness of liverpool isn't it i think one of the one of the big strengths of them is that you just keep going you sell it with a dozen shots in the game you know how many times have we seen nunes having sort of eight nine shots in the game diaz seems to have a lot of you know that they're relentless but i think one of the part of the reason they're relentless is cuz they're not clinical 
to start with, you know. So they they have to be relentless, otherwise it'll just be like, oh, you've you've failed again. You know, they have they have to keep going. Whereas I think I, I always do think this like a little bit more City in particular, but I think Arsenal are not far off. They're just a bit more kind of clinical in 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 final, and I don't even mean finishing. I mean sort of. Picking the right pass in in a, in a three on two or a four on three. I think Liverpool. Are a little, there was a couple in in the even in the first. I think Diaz had one where he he, yeah. he has to roll Nunes in. See Salo one. Where he could have squared it. They're just a little bit like that. But on the flip side of that, what you get out of that is that they just keep keep going and they always think it's their day. Yeah, I wonder if it is. It's sort of. It's hard because I think Neil spot on in terms of saying I think we could be a bit more clinical. I, I think it's. Not a relaxed approach, but I think the benefits of creating that many chances is do you think they're going to get another one? Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I don't yeah. think it's a case of, oh, if I miss this one, it's all right, I'll get another one. I think it's just, I think they just go into games with that much confidence in terms of going forward that they just think there'll be another one. And I agree, they can be a bit wasteful around, around the penalty area. I think. I, so, I sometimes wonder if they, 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 we always have been a little bit under this manager in terms of, you know, mm. we've always created chances. I think, you know, I, I, I've been critical of Diaz in the past and stuff, but when people talk about the likes of him and Nunes and are uh, these clinical as like a prime salad and man, I think, well, they used to miss a lot of chances. Firmino used to miss a lot of chances. I think, I think it's always been a little bit part of our game. I think that, that in terms of going one nil down, and which you mentioned earlier, I think I'd worry about that in the home games towards the back end if we, if we, you know, if we're going for the title in terms of the crowd and stuff, and how, how navy it might make the players and stuff. But I think yesterday that that goal was just one of them. I think it's obviously I think that the things we could have stopped along the way, but if if you put down the top corner like that, you know, I think you just got to say fair enough. It's it's a great strike, and I, and I just think. I think I think Liverpool can be better. I think they do have hard lines on the offside goal. You know that that's like that, that's sort of a build up of really good playing, yeah. constant pressure, and you score a really good goal like that. And obviously, it is offside, but you know you got hard lines. It's a yard or two either way. Um, but no, I, 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 I don't I don't think it's it, it's a massive concern. I think obviously the obvious thing to say is if we weren't creating chances, and that was just a, yeah. a stalemate at two one for a long time in a navy game. I think what where where I, where I was comfortable in that second half was I thought well, we're getting chances here like one of them will go and we'll make it 3-1 I got a little bit nervy after the I don't know if anyone else thought about that do you remember the other year when we when we lost the league by a point and we were 2-0 up and man I get to disallow a goal for, was, it, was it tackling their keeper or offside mm, to make yeah, it 3-0 yeah, yeah. first half and then they obviously mm. pull it back to 2-2 when that when that three one got ruled out, I thought, oh, this is going to be that's going to be that the, the turning point because I think it can sort of when you get one like that, it was a bit of a let off for like a couple of seconds, yeah, especially yeah. in the copy. That was crazy. My, um, my nerve, my nervy one was remembering the Leicester away game in twenty one twenty two when Salah has a million chances in that one and missed the penalty. Yeah, yeah. Manny misses a one on one at nil Puts nil. Over the bar, that yeah. was that was that was the one that was in my head. Like every now and again, we have one of these, and I was just con- that was that was my own. apart from that, I was like, I'm fine with all the chances, but then this thing in my head went. Do you remember? Lesser away though, <laughs> yeah. I was like, and I couldn't shake it off there for a period. Yeah, but these things happen. Yeah, I, I remember thinking as well. N- Nunes was quite yesterday. We, we had a lot of chances in a game where he didn't seem to have his usual five or six shots a game. And I think you've got to sort of factor that into just thinking about games going forward. He's likely to have a lot of shots and a lot of chances in other games as well as the ones we created yesterday. He only scored the best goal of all time, didn't he? That one off the, off the deck. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's unbelievable. We were saying I couldn't believe the power he got on it. Like, yeah, only yeah. hooked his leg. It's the kind of goal. That, <laughs> I honestly think Var would have looked at that for about seven minutes because yeah, it was yeah. just like felt like there was something wrong. So, yeah, yeah so, some Alex seen, can't get given. Have you seen how he saves at the keeper? He's not even like back, trying to save it. He back of his calf. Yeah. It goes, oh God, what was that? It is the back of his calf. Yeah. It could just hit the back of his calf and yeah. go in. It's the back yeah. of his calf. The, the, the defining uh, part of the game, Paddy, for us was, was midfield. I think all three of them, I think it's one of the reasons why the manager spends as long as he does without making a change. He gets into 80 minutes. And also, I think the nature of that game, where it's as much a, a mental thing as anything else, if you're in it, fine. The idea of introducing someone. But that said, you know, I, I thought all three midfielders acquit themselves really, really well. But let's start with the clear man of the match. It's it's a phenomenal, another phenomenal, but I'd say the best so far, Alexis McAllister performance. Yeah, I think... You know, we're watching we're watching a player really grow into like world class elite status for us. I think that this this happens a lot with players where they come in and you think you've got a good player here, got a good player, and then before you know it, a couple of months down the line, you're like, no, we've got like the best in his position in the league or possibly the world here. I think it happened with Van Dyke, it happened with the goalkeeper. I think he's on. I think he's honestly getting to that level of he, he is that good. Um, not that I have major concerns about him when we first signed him. I just I thought we were getting a really good player, but I wasn't sure we were getting this this level of player. I mean, it's high praise, but I I, I I compared them the other day to, to, to Modric. You know, when you see a player who's just... You know, for, for years I always thought about Modric. I know he's brilliant, he plays every week for Real Madrid, but like, what is it that he's brilliant at? He's not posting up, like, 
double figures goals every season, but he's just brilliant at everything. everything. He's brilliant <laughs> yeah. at tackling. You can't get the ball off him. Yeah, he's not fast, but it doesn't need to be fast if you can't get the ball off him. When he does, mate, when he does get, he, he's, he's quick into a challenge and he makes sure he wins it because he probably knows he hasn't got the legs to, to go again and press again. I, I, I thought yesterday was a real, like, I'm putting this team on my back and dragging towards 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 a, a win here. I think I said at half time, you know, I thought, I thought, thought, we, we, thought we grew into the game better the second half by just keep giving him the ball. Something's going to happen if you keep giving him the ball. He, 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 there was a couple that he put over the top to Salah first half, and you're just like that, that, that's ridiculous. Like that pass is not yeah. to, to pull to pull that off. Never, never mind see it. And then I thought, you know, th- you know, obviously the goal, the, the the assist is just that level of calm. It, it really reminded me of like it reminded me of that Thiago moment at um, at Wembley, Easter weekend two years ago. You know when they're playing lovely football on the box and he just stops it, chips it over to Mane. And they score that goal, but so I was like fired into his feet, which I'm, I'm sure McAllister was happy with. But a lot of players wouldn't be happy with that kind of yeah. pass, that, and he just stops it dead. And then to have that calm around the penalty, it is to just fire, again fire into Salah's feet, and they essentially tell him what to do with it: one touch and get your shot off. He was um, that was a, it was a real it was a real leader's performance, and I think he, he's stepping up at, at the perfect time for us. I, I, the best thing about him is as a midfielder, is he's always on the scene, with or without the ball. So if someone's got the ball, he's the option. If someone else, if the other team's got the ball, he's either tackling or he's the second player to go and press it. He's just he's never in the wrong place as a midfielder, and I think that I think Modric is a great comparison. I, I mean, I think that assist is almost like it's a bit like Javi, that kind of you know like yeah. sort of you know, those ones where really used, people used to watch Barcelona and go oh, just oh, pass 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 pass. But it's like that's that's the ball, isn't it? You know that's the edge of the box. I think yeah, a lot of people would have gone come on, take a touch and hit it. No, I'll just roll it into him and he will have a a, a beautiful goal. Um, he's He's some player. He is absolutely some player. I remember I saw it. he was on match today two last night. Glenn Murray, who played Brighton, I spoke to him in the summer. And he said, he said, you, you, I've got no idea how good he is. He said, like he's just he's just a proper proper player's player as well. Like, you know, he, if he's on your team in five a side in in training, you made up because he's just he's just a proper player. And I saw him talk about him last night and saying he's underappreciated. I don't think he will be. I think he'd be. I'd be surprised if he's not in the running for the PFA Player of the Year, personally. I think he'll be right in there. Yeah, he's been phenomenal for a couple of months now. And, you know, it is great. And he was good before then. Yeah, yeah he think. was yeah. good. But, but it's funny, like, earlier in the season, I remember thinking, like, oh, you know, when everyone's fit, I'm not sure if he gets in the team. And, and I was thinking maybe he's our fourth midfielder. I was thinking, you know, because Curtis Jones playing really well, suppose I was obviously flying, and you're thinking, oh, is he one who comes in and, and almost like as a rotation <laughs> now he's like the best one yeah. do you know what I mean it's him and then two others whoever you want yeah. <laughs> because you'll make them better and it's just it's just it's phenomenal there's some some players you know like I think you you look back on players careers and it's no coincidence that when he goes in when he's in a team they go and they go and get really good you know he's coming to Brighton and they've, all of a sudden Brighton are a proper team goes into the Argentina team they've won the World Cup all of a sudden there, there was, there was players like that who maybe you don't think about them as sort of Oh, these are like greats. But like you think of like Rakitic. You think of like Rakitic, Arturo Vidal, you think about him, you go, Wow, like Say it look, look at what they look what yeah. these players win. But he's he's in that sort of thing where every team he's in is a serious team. You go, got him. Like he's you know, they're gonna be in contention to win I, stuff. I remember, I, I remember thinking of Bournemouth away was like a big turning point for him in terms of I think he played well before them, but Bournemouth away, I think he's been yeah, out he's the team, hasn't he, with the injury and then they were played really well in them games around Christmas time. And there was a bit of chatter like, oh, is he, is he the six now? If, if he comes in and plays an eight, now is he going to get in the team? Like John said, and he just he just came in and made made sure every challenge was won, every pass was perfect. And then since then, he's just just continued to go up at a level, a level. I think I think it always it's always like worth noticing what other players, especially the really really good ones, think about players. And you like the, the, the dads who you'd say with our best players, Virgil and Salah, they absolutely love them. Good players know who the really good players are, and they all adore them. I think they know that he's one of us, he's one of these elite level players who, who can carry us. Yeah, get him the ball, they seem to be wanting yeah. to do, yeah. won't they? Like, like you say, Paddy, the, the best players. Anyway, anywhere, anywhere yeah. on the pitch they give him. Yeah, well, that's it. I mean, and, and the build up to the goal, like Sabos, like. The, the easiest ball is just to cross it over and I don't think anyone would have quibbled if he'd have yeah. done that but he's like no there, there's Alexis I'll get it into him like you say fire it into him he's happy to do that yeah. and he'll make something happen and, and, and he does and like good footballers look for each other and, and they're all looking for McAllister at the moment um, Endo is it's interesting for me Neil in that 
he's the one who I think has the most tactical responsibility with the idea of it being different because it's Brighton. So he's been doing a bit more of this than we've seen even Fabinho do going back years in terms of splitting the centre halves. But it's a day big time of you know he almost looks like a centre half in terms of when he's picked the ball up and uh, over the course of the game. There's a lot of him making himself available. There's a lot of him having to anticipate what it is that they want to do. I think it was it's another one of those games where you just I think he must be a remarkably coachable footballer. I mean that as a compliment to everyone involved. Yeah, I mean he. He's obviously very tactically aware, isn't he? He's got a he's actually got a blog, hasn't he? A tactical blog where he, he dissects his own performances and stuff. So he clearly is a, I hate the phrase, but he's a student of the game. Yeah. But he, he, he clearly takes a lot of pride in that that side of it. I think it shows his growth. I, I don't think he could have played against Brighton back in October. I think you but he didn't yeah, but he didn't. He didn't start, did he? But you wouldn't have you wouldn't have put him into that game if they'd gone, that's a bit early for him there, you know. We we sort of need this kind of more yeah, really smart experience. Points, yeah. he, he played in that game. Played really well. He's another one. Him and McAllister are very similar in terms of you, you. You can just rely on them to get the foot in, and you can rely on them to get the ball when you need them to get it. They don't often sort of, they don't often lose like a sort of a one they have to win. Mm. The, the two of them, and he's been again. You know, I know we, we, we're, everything's positive, isn't it? Because they're top of the league, but you just think, well, where, where's a better signing than, than those two yeah. this this season in the Premier League? Where where are they? I don't see. I don't know anyone. Circa so fifty million for the two of them. Yeah, fifty. It's million. crazy. I mean, that's, that's unbelievable, isn't it? It's, uh, like what? What? I think. What did Ward Prowse go for? Forty. Hmm. <laughs> well, he's, not, he's, he's no longer in West Ham's first eleven. Ward Prowse. No, exactly. I mean, that, you know, but and and that's not. A, he's not a bad footballer at all. But mm. you're looking at that and going, what? What were? What were the rest of the world doing? Like, how, how did Liverpool do that? Or is it? Is it the recruitment, or is it the manager, or is it a bit of both? But there's something about it that just Liverpool just keep keep finding these jackpot players. And I know we haven't we we'll go on and talk about them. I thought Sobosla was brilliant as well yesterday, yeah. by the way. I said something similar about McCallis in terms of receiving the ball anyway. But I think the thing that does impress you most with Endo is the fact that he makes himself available for that yeah. pass time and time again. Receiving the ball, obviously he's in midfield, he's played midfield all his life, so we be used to it, but receiving the ball with your back to goal is not easy. It's like it's a completely different skill to playing another kind of football, especially in the Premier League when both sides press, and, and, and there's arguably no better side doing it than Brighton at the moment. And for instance, he's, he's lived the experience of what happens to him at Crystal Palace away. Yeah, yeah. You know, early in the campaign when Will when Hughes... When he locked on to him and Andy... was and he, all yeah. over him all game. And I just thought yesterday there was loads of time second half when not we were struggling to get out, but just they were set in a certain way where... When we're obviously playing the show from the goalkeeper, it'd be at Quantas feet or Van Dyke's feet, and you think, unless we go long here, we're not getting out, and they obviously want us to do that. And then all of a sudden, you see Endo pop up in between the two of them, get it on the half turn, and play it forward, and you'd be like, he, that, he's just boxed that for us there, he's just, he's just got us out completely. And I think, I, 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 I'm lost for words in terms of how good of a footballer we've got, because I, I didn't think we were getting, even the Christmas games, when, when, he, when he, he seems to step up a level and, and people were high praise, I thought, yeah, he's battling really well here, he's winning his tackles, he's doing, but, but now I think, like, I mean, not that I've got a big list of number sixes, but there's arguably not anyone to swap them for in world football in terms of that position and, and what we want from our team because, you know, his ability on the ball is, is ridiculous. It, it, it's so good. You very rarely see him give away a pass. You very rarely see him pick the wrong decision. Um, no, another one where at the minute you look and thinking, I don't, I don't, I think we look a better team with him in it. And I think this is the most set the midfield looked all season in terms of, I'm not sure McAllister's. An eight, as, as people might say now and say, like, oh, he's because he's playing further forward, he's such a better player. I think they look at times like a double six and then helping each other out, but it just, it just seems to be working so well. And you know, he's been fantastic. Yeah, it, it, it's been incredible, you know, watching him grow and, and watching him grow every week in terms of you can see his confidence is sort of sky high. He feels like a Liverpool player, doesn't he? He looks like a Liverpool yeah. player, and watching him. I love seeing him watching Phil in different positions as the game develops as well because that's a real intelligent player. Like, I know we're going to come on to talk about Virgil, but Virgil decided to start pressing. At some point, yeah. he was he was going forward to to press and and fucking hell, like that's a, that's a pressing monster. If you, you know, <laughs> imagine sort of looking up for a pass and he's like in front that, of you. I like that Moda thinks he's pressing Virgil and Virgil just goes at one point. All right, well you can have a big yeah, ball of it. Let's yeah, go. Like, You're yeah. going all the way there. I'm going I mean, all the way with you. There's, there's a, it's, it's a long way round him, isn't it? Is what, is what I would say, Virgil, when, when he's he, all his limbs are. Coming at you, and so so it was really effective. <laughs> but obviously, like there is a bit of a risk there because he's he's getting out of position. But whenever Virgil did that, Endo just sort of just sort of slides in, and there was one way they do sort of beat the press, and then they go. But but we've got to settle back four because Endo's in there, and then McAllister's getting back into sort of you know into the DM role, and so the smart footballers 
and this, and when you've got intelligence around you, you can take a few risks. And I feel like that's how they all feel with each other, but especially with Endo there, they all feel like like Sabosla is just popping up everywhere. He's playing left wing at one point. He, he's looking for the space. He's looking to okay, well, how, how can I get in and sort of you know overload or hurt them? So he's giving himself an almost free roll to Bosley at, at, at one point. You know, he's popping up one wing and then the other just looking for space because he's got confidence in, in what's in the middle and they're just backing each other and, and it's brilliant to see. But Endo was a massive part of that. He must be he must be a, a dream to play alongside. Uh, on Sabosley, it was interesting to listen to your your, your post match audio show this morning on the way in John at the Glen Book and there was a bit of Sabos like wasn't that good first half got better seconds and you and I were sitting together in the match and I think there's a thing sometimes where you sit because I think the thing that both you and I noticed was Really clever movements. Yeah. It, they just weren't getting it to him. But really clever movements. And the manager does it in his in his comments. He says we showed them a few things at half time as to where the space was and what we could do. And I just think if, I wonder if a bit of that was it's a boss like Yeah, look at his shuttle. And, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and he's asked shuttling and he's asking for it and he wasn't getting it. I thought, you know, we, at times we were a bit cautious with, with, with some of our passing. I thought Quantum in particular was was I think he got caught quite early and then got a bit nervy about it. And there was some times where a pass would be on and he got, oh then just give it give it to Virgil or 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 whatever and I think like you know you understand because like Paddy says they probably are the best pressing team in the country and then also when you give it to the them best you, traps they're the yeah, best of traps yeah. I think the good than, traps yeah. the good at pressing and, and then also when, when you give it to them you don't see it for a minute and a half because they, 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 they're really good at keeping it as well so so I sort of understand even though I was getting frustrated at the time on reflection I sort of understand where they were, where they were being a bit cautious sometimes but I felt like you know suppose that he'd, he'd, he'd shut left and ask for the ball and not get it and then he goes sort of the other way and then he was like Why, you know get me on the ball get me on the ball I thought we were better that second half better getting him on it and you know we, we were a better team for it we spent so much of last season didn't we talking about midfield and, and legs and saying you know just oh, just it was so stilted wasn't it in, in the way that they were playing they were just they weren't able to do they, they, they knew what they needed to do and they knew that they can do it or they used to be able to do it but they just couldn't and I think so it's like what he brought in terms of just that ability to stride forward carry, carry the ball you know he isn't always, I don't think, reliable with the shooting from outside the box. I think, I think he, I think he can be better. We've seen him do it obviously a couple of times, but and I think sometimes you see him doesn't quite pick the right moment to do it, or or, or vice versa. But I think the, the fact that he's got that quality in his locker as well just gives you something, something different. He, he does a lot of the Henderson stuff, doesn't he? He, he plays right, right wing yeah. some, so much, but he gets into those really good positions as as he's seen for the goal. I think he's just, yeah, he, he's had tough time with with obviously the injury. But it's it's easy to forget. We, we haven't even scratched the surface. I don't think of his potential. Was he twenty three? Younger, you know? younger. I think he's only 20, 21, 22. Yeah, I mean, we are, we're, we're seeing a really, really good player now. But he's going to get better and better as well. And I think he's got all the tools to be a proper, proper player for Liverpool. I think that's what's most exciting, and I think I agree with you, Neil. I think it's 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 not even that. When he does shoot, sometimes it's it's. I think he should. I think it's this decision making yeah, around yeah. the box. This time, he's so like you think just second take one more touch. Yeah. You're like, you've got the quality to just mm. ping that. Yeah. You, you don't. You don't need. You don't need that extra touch to set yourself. But I think. But all that we've seen in glimpses, and I think you look at his age, and you've seen the the, the glimpses of quality. And you think that's just going to come. I think relax about that. I think it's interesting what John was saying about where you sit in the ground and stuff. I'm obviously in the cop behind the goal and. First half, he, he, was, he was doing my head and because I felt a bit sorry for Conte because I thought I understood that he was trying to make himself available for the pass, but. You know, I, I'm seeing it. I'm constantly seeing it, be, and I'm thinking that pass isn't on. Or if I ever give it to you here, a bit uh, talk about them setting traps and stuff, and that that game in October, we're one pass away from. If you lose the ball there, mm. there's three of them on me now. So I think Quanta was a bit like, I don't need you here. Stop getting. Don't, I don't need you. I don't, I don't need you getting it off my toes. That, that's that, that's what I was getting a little bit annoyed with in the first half. I thought if you're the most advanced of the three, I don't need you getting it off Quanta's toes. Leave that to someone else. There's Joe Gomez talking inside as well. But I thought, I thought second half he seemed to just play a little bit higher. Um, and he was more effective, and then just in terms of like the way creating like the, the, like the, the Henderson S qualities, it's it's the 10, 15 yard presses yeah. with, with on, on eighty five when you think everyone's knackered here and like physically and mentally drained, and they're trying to put, and they're playing out, and you think oh, they're gonna have one last attack here. He just goes and presses the ball and wins a throw in, or makes one of them play it out. Whatever. I, I think there's difference as well. I, I you know the way they use for for McAllister and Endo is like humility in the way that they play. That they're, they're they're brilliant, but they're sort of it's all it's, there's nothing showy about it. I think Sobosla is a lot more. Out, outwardly sort yeah. of confident, but his his work rate is 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 humble. Yeah, you know, like it's it's, 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 it's there's no sort of luxury player about him. Even though he he's probably got that attitude. I've, I've heard him. You know, I've heard countless interviews with him this season, and he just basically always says, "Yeah, we want to win everything." And like you think, oh, steady on, like, you know, like <laughs> he was saying it in September, wasn't he? Like I want to win the league yeah. of Harland and all that kind of stuff. But 
he it, it doesn't manifest in the way he plays. He doesn't ever look like you know one of them. Oh, it's not my day today. It's just right. His his response to sort of a, a bit of adversity is I'll just run harder and I'll just do a bit more work and that's very Liverpool, isn't it? But he's he's probably a new version of, of Liverpool with this with the the, the, the skill set and the quality he's got. The, the 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 last one in this little segment I want to run through, John, is is Elliot because. He doesn't actually get that much time on the pitch. It's only 18, 19 minutes, and if anything, arguably, he theoretically plays up front. But he does play like a midfielder all the way through. He's joining it up. And I, I thought it was it, he was the perfect sub at the perfect time in every single way. And he made Liverpool more robust, more able to keep the ball uh, at that stage. I just think it's another really impressive cameo. Yeah, it is. And, and I think he would have come on sooner, but the midfield were playing well and, and, and I think he wanted to keep them on. And so you think. And it was a mad situation where every set, every time the ball went dead for five minutes as he was stood there, it, <laughs> yeah, was, like he, a, it was a threatening set piece for them. Or, or at one point, it was a corner for us and he didn't want to take Nunez off because why would you make yourself smaller and all of that? Yes, yeah, so it, yeah, it, it took him at least five minutes to come on, but I think even the decision to, to bring him on would have been a bit sooner. But the midfield was playing well. And, and normally he's a sub for Sebastian is isn't he? And, but but Sebastian, you know, like Paddy says, you know, just gets the base of energy. And he's, and he's such an asset for you in every way, you know, from his creativity and some of his passing yesterday was was sublime. But but also from a defensive point of view, I, I understood why. And then you know, we don't want to take a forward off too early. I mean, suppose you could twist again if you if you need to. But you know, he, I felt like it was it was just a, a game situation rather than anything. So it was a negative on him why he wasn't on, on early. But then you know, every time he comes onto the pitch, he he, he makes an impact. You know, his his application. You know, Neil used the word humility there. It's it's in all of them, isn't it? You you coming on to, you know, and and you work late to minimum, isn't it? You coming on and, and you coming on to change a game, and they all want to, you know, they're all creative players and and they're all fantastic players, and they and they want to show the talent and show what they've got, and they think they can win games for the club, and and at different times they all have, you know, won games. You know, it's it's Elliot who wins that one at Palace, isn't it? Um, you know, nearly went to Old Trafford and, as well. So it's it's you know he's done that, but but I think they know that the minimum is that I'm coming on to to, to graph for this football team, and then and then everything else will follow after that. Uh, coming up uh, in a minute or two, we'll talk about Van Dijk and we'll talk about uh, Luis Diaz. But before then, uh, John last week uh, interviewed Josh Williams about his book Data Game. Um, so let's do that. It is John Gibbons with Josh Williams, uh, author and writer of this fantastic book you see before you, uh, Data Game, the story of Liverpool FC's analytics revolution. Uh, thanks for coming in uh, to talk about it. We've done a longer version of this for tour subscribers, and so if you want to know more, you do subscribe, uh, you'll get me and Josh going into great detail uh, on the book and the background and why he did it and the story, which is in the book up to the point where, where FSG take control of Liverpool. But that's where I want to start on this sort of condensed version because... You know, John Henry in particular at FSG at, um, at Boston Red Sox have, have got you know a data-led approach, a belief that that data can give you the edge. They take over Liverpool. They want to go that way as well. They think that's how they're going to get the edge over in the Premier League. Um, but it's not as easy as just clicking your fingers and it happens. Uh, they had to kiss a few frogs before they <laughs> met the princes and stuff like that. Yeah. But. I mean, parts of it do come together quite quickly, you know, in terms of recruitments and stuff like that. You know, Michael Edwards is is very soon in there, brought in by Camoni. He he then recommends uh, Ian Graham and, and and some of these guys who who become a bedrock to, to Liverpool's data led approach are there sort of quite quickly. But in terms of building that data, deciding what the relevant data is, and then how to use that, does take a little bit of a time, and that's an interesting period that you document in the book. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting to see how it played out. To be honest, because I think I, I think the the narrative from the outside looking in, it just looks like Liverpool have been completely clueless, and then Jurgen Klopp comes in and teaches everyone about football, <laughs> and then we sign hit after hit after hit and look good on the pitch and all that stuff. But I think there's there's reasons behind in the first five years or so why Liverpool look clueless and make a few mistakes. Uh, and there's some individuals responsible for that. Like I think, I, I mean, we touched on it in the longer show, but Camoli is an interesting one as to why Liverpool went down a certain route, for example, in terms of a playing style, uh, why Liverpool invested so much in an Andy Carroll, and then consequently Stuart Down and Charlie Adam, Jordan Henderson. There's a reason that we went down that route and it wasn't the best decision. Um, obviously, Brendan Rodgers was another one, you know, in terms of just not really... Um, embracing the concept of recruitment through numbers yeah. and, and, and that sort of thing and just having just an unwavering belief in his own ego basically and, and, and his 
his kind of word being gospel. And that's obviously a problem when you're trying to recruit based on a collaborative, evidence-based um, approach to things. Like if you've got some fella who's in charge of the team and you sign, for example, a Iago Aspas, if the man in charge of the team doesn't like him, he's not going to play him. Mm. You know, and it's it it goes back to um to so many examples of stories like that where where, where you get in a good player. I think I think it happens in Moneyball actually, where they sign a player and he's not getting played in certain roles, so he ends up just firing a coach and goes something and just playing the player in the in the desired spot, and he ends up doing quite well. So, yeah, so many reasons we're early on as to why Liverpool took time to get to this destination, why Liverpool got it wrong initially. Um, who got it right at the start and then gradually got more power as the as the process went on, like how Michael Edwards yeah. who's now back at the club. But um yeah, I wanted to shine a light on on on, on that story basically, because I don't think it's told enough and um these guys in the book you know, tend to shun the limelight really and I think they deserve more credit. What comes out to me was a couple of things during that time is that first of all, if you're gonna do it you got to commit to it. It can't be this thing you yeah. say, oh, we'll let the stats labs have for me, you know, and then we'll let the manager have Ben Teche, and then, and then they're looking at each other. Like, for me, I used to look at Ben Teche, like, they had two heads, didn't you? Like, what am yeah, I yeah, to do yeah. with this fellow? And so, so that really comes out. If you, so if you're going to commit to it, you need to commit to it wholeheartedly, and then also you need everyone aligned. And so obviously Brendan Rodgers wasn't. He had a mistrust. I think it is fair to say, you know, of some of these people, you know, who are gaining sort of in power. Whereas Jürgen comes in and goes, "Well, I'm a bit more used to this actually." And and Jürgen is an interesting character generally because although he's obviously you know got a lot of confidence in himself with that, and maybe it's you know there's a bit of a less insecurity. I don't know, but but. He, he accepts that he hasn't got all the answers. So Jürgen knows what he's good at and yeah. knows what he needs help with and knows that people can give him more information to help him better than the job. And and that must have been great for, for some of those guys who you talk about in the book to come here and go, right, OK, well, this fella, A, understands what we're all about and B, doesn't think he's got all the answers and is listened, willing to listen at least to people who have. Yeah, well, that, that's what I wanted to paint a picture of in the book, to be honest. Everyone knows Jürgen Klopp's really good at what he does. Everyone knows he's an elite coach and all that stuff. But from like a data perspective, the guys who were already at the club who were, who were responsible for recruitments and things like that, what Klopp really offered was was number one a clear identity and a playing style, but number two just a willingness to collaborate and and you know just kind of sit back and go listen I am not the expert you know more than I do, sound make the decision and I think. Say for example, if Rogers was still, I keep using Rogers as an example, don't I? But it's not our fault. It was him. He was there. He was at the scene <laughs> of the crime. If Rogers was at the club when Liverpool have that salad decision to make, just a guess. But I, I, I would suspect Rogers would be a bit like he's a he's a Premier League flop or something like that. When in reality that was never the case. Um, so Klopp definitely helped the alignment side of things. He he brought a lot of departments together and. Um, while being the face of the operation and the media side and, and being the ultimate character and all that, um, just helped with the alignment behind the scenes. And, and you mentioned there about like signing Firmino and Ben Seke in the same summer, one's for the committee and one's for Rogers, And you end up with, with a, 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 a model of, a, of an approach and a model of a playing style. And I, I recently heard a quote, actually, I can't remember exactly how the quote went, but I thought it was really fitting. And it's, it was something along the lines of like, if you ask two people at the same time to draw a horse, it will look like a camel. <laughs> and I think that was, that was what Liverpool ended up suffering from eventually. Um, buying players for the manager, buying players for the committee. The manager doesn't like the committee players. The committee have doubts about the manager, manager players. And you just, you, you go in different directions. And if, you, if you're going in different directions, if you're trying to walk in different directions, you will never actually get anywhere. Yeah. You'll just keep going like we'll go up, you know, we'll go over there and you never actually get to town. You know what I mean? You'll end up in speak or something or, <laughs> and then you'll end up in Wilton and that and so um yeah, that was what Klopp offered from a from a data perspective. He just kind of brought the whole organisation together a little bit and um maybe in towards the back end there was a little bit more conflict between people, you know, something like that. But certainly at Liverpool's peak, everyone was singing from the same hymn sheet. The, the data touches every part of the, of the, the football club now and, and, and has done for a sort of few years and you talk about the, these different ways you can you can get the edge and you can you know you can improve as, as a team you know on and off the pitch really but 
you know, the, the, the guys in charge and Ian Graham is clear that, that it's transfers and it's recruitments that, that drives the success of the football team. And my favourite chapter of the book, you asked me that before, I said I'd have a think about it, was, was when that was detailed, how that was done. Because you can say, OK, we want to be better at transfers or you can say, OK, we want to look at the data. But what is that data? And obviously these departments won't just look at you know, certain, you know, you talk about tackles and things like that, you know, or, or, or shots or, or, or chances created, which was the big sort of camoli one. But mm. the, what they've done is they've built their own model. They haven't just sort of, you know, thought, oh, we'll look at all these stats that are out there and opted. They've, they've built their own model. And it was my, the, the bit I found the most interesting was the insight into the model that they built. And it was all about goals added effectively. So yeah. for every footballer on the pitch, you know how how many goals are they adding to a football team across the season, or how many have you taken away? Because there's the minus as well, which which frightened me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, and Liverpool went and signed one of the minus players, by the way, in Paul Konchesky, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> just yeah. Throwing who, was, who was from the original data as, as a minus player in yeah. that West Ham team? Yeah, so, uh, yeah. we bought him. Yeah, exactly, Insane. exactly. You know, you, you've only got a question. Wonder what Ian Graham's doing at that time, just shaking his head as a, as a Liverpool fan, just <laughs> you know, not sport. But that's the that's the the, the, the model. That that they built and, and every player had a goals value and goals win games. Exactly, yeah. That's if you if you really bring it down to the crux of the sport, it is about scoring goals and not conceding goals at the opposite end. It's kind of as simple as that. So you want to recruit players who will have an impact on those two elements. What players will help us score goals while helping us not concede goals, ideally at the same time. That was one of the reasons why Naby Keita was originally painted as this kind of freak in the data, really, because he was quite clearly not specifically contributing to one side of the game. He was massively contributing to both, and this was when he was at his athletic best, and he was um, really empowered to be like the, um, you know, given the keys to the team and things like that. I think when he got to Liverpool, it just kind of changed, specifically fitness version. Um, the was a down version of that we ended up seeing and things like that because of fitness problems and stuff. But that ability anyway to, to put a number on what a player is doing is just nowhere near done enough in, in football where you you identify what this player is worth in terms of goals and then as a result of doing that you identify roughly what he's worth in terms of points over the course of a season and you make squad building decisions based on what each player is worth in terms of points. And the lads who are costing you points, you let them go. The lads who are um, delivering you points, you extend the contracts and give them more money. Um, players that you sign, you you sign them based on the points they're delivering for RB Leipzig yeah. or for Atalanta or Barcelona or whatever. And you bring them to Liverpool. And hopefully you get to a point whereby you've got a squad full of players who just make a difference for you in terms of getting you towards 90 points and you've got nobody hopefully in the squad who will come on and, and cost you points and, and you know over the course of five or ten years Liverpool got to a point where they, they won the Premier League and they won the Champions League and they were you know edging towards Centurions and, and un, uh, Invincible seasons and all that stuff and a lot of it was because of uh, this approach to things. Yeah, it is an analytics revolution. Uh, that is the right word. And, yeah. and the, the, the book really sort of documents that really well. And, and just how quickly it has all happened, you know, in, in what, 25 years um, since I think Man United, you know, said, oh, we'll have a go with ProZone and see what that's like. So 25 years to now, you think about the history of football, you know, it, it's not a lot really, but it has happened, you know, so quickly. It is really well documented in the book. If you want to, you know, learn more about this sort of thing, there is the longer conversation with me and Josh. But to be honest, just buy the book. Uh, that is the <laughs> The best way uh, to enjoy everything in it. It is the data game, the story of Liverpool FC's analytics the revolution. There's loads um, in the, the documents, you know, the history where we got to now and, you know, what Liverpool did uh, to get ahead and to win all those trophies and hopefully win a few more uh, before the end, now and the end of the season. But Josh, uh, thanks for coming in. Best of luck with it. Hope it sells loads. Cheers, mate. Nice one. Back in a... Very good. Uh, Josh's book, by the way, to get stuck into it. It is good. Yeah. Enjoyed it. Really enjoyed it. Excellent news. Uh, and then um, at the end of the season, we're going to do something at Manford Hall. Tickets are selling fast. Um, I'm not going to, they're selling so fast, I'm going to be really light on the information. You just know now that they're selling fast, so you're going to have to sort that out. <laughs> <laughs> uh, over to you. Uh, over to you. Pressure on you uh, at this point. Uh, night before Wolves, uh, God knows where we all are then. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll work it all out as we get closer and closer. I've got no plan for the show. I've got no idea what we're going to talk about because uh, it feels as though everything is live uh, at this point. 
in time. Um, Neil's bringing the trophy with him. He says. <laughs> it's, it's, it's one at Spurs. He's bringing it with him. Uh, I would, I would, absolute scenes, if so. Um, <laughs> we. Um, I want to talk about Diaz because I think it's a big goal, Neil Jones. I always think it's a big performance. It was. He's obviously. The shoes he's filling, and I want to be really clear about this, I think that the shoes he's filling, I think there's an argument, the best year in Liverpool's history, and Liverpool's history stretches back to 1892, the best year in Liverpool's history is 2019. The best player in 2019 for Liverpool is Sadio Mane. Um, so the best player in Liverpool's best ever calendar year is the shoes that ultimately, I know they played in the same team for a period that Diaz is filling. And I think that in a number of ways yesterday was one of his performances that was closest to not just the idea of a Mane performance, yeah, yeah. but a Mane 2019 performance. That's how good I thought he was yesterday. It was a Mane goal. It was Definitely a Mane goal, a Mane yeah. Goal. I can, I, I, you could almost sort of imagine Mane yeah, I think yeah. I've seen Mane score it, you know, yeah. that, that kind of sort of, you know, anticipation and, and execution. I think, he, I think he's one of the big, Big ones who benefited from the injury crisis, Diaz, because I think he, I think he went on his shoulders, and I think he went right. Let's have it. You know, Salah was out, Jota was out, Nunez was in Nunez and out. Nunez was in and out. You know, there was, I mean, you had Bobby Clark and McConnell and people like that on the pitch, and, and but you think, I think that Wembley game, but but there was others where it was like, Lewis, you, we need you here. Like you're you're sort of the only one who's got any kind of. Um, you know, game-changing ability with the ball, and I think he really stepped up in that period. And I think he's 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 carried on since since the sort of cavalry returned, if you like. Um, he's another one, isn't he? Because I, I get frustrated with him because I think oh, just just go past someone or just just take that chance. That what you know, he obviously missed the the, the the three against City, didn't he? So frustrated with him. But then you're almost a bit like, oh, I love you though. Like you, know, you sort of, you know, I love the way you just keep going and you just keep doing it. And he, he sort of sums up Liverpool in a, in a in a lot of ways because I think a lot of people would look at Diaz and I think a lot of people look at Liverpool. I think outside of Liverpool, look and go, they're not that good. I think people still think it. People still look at this title race and go, City and Arsenal are the best two teams, and Liverpool are just in there somehow. But they're not like they're brilliant players, aren't they? And I think we just need to sort of. Step back a little bit and go. Do you know what? Like all all the things that frustrate us about individual players or about individual games or moments. It's what it's what Liverpool are. They're just well. We're gonna we're gonna frustrate you, but by the end you'll be smiling. Don't worry. Just 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 stick with them. I think Diaz is one of the best embodiments of it. I, I I'm like Neil. I think I, I do get frustrated with them at times, and I think on you could you could beat that man. Go, go at him. And I think I I wonder. I was thinking about it this week because I think he has been playing really well. And I I, I wonder if. If we look back at that first six months, not with rose tinted glasses, but I think I wonder if he had less responsibility then because he, he was new into the side. He come in in January, yeah, yeah. he was told, "Listen, go and play your football." Whereas now, I think, especially especially in second halves of games, when he when he doesn't quite take that man on, he'll he'll, he'll just stand them up and wait, wait wait for the fullback to overlap or he'll play inside, and you think you could have gone on him there. I think he's absolutely running his legs off. Like maybe maybe he hasn't got that one in him, or maybe he's saving it for yeah. for eighty five when he thinks the fullback's gonna have uh, you know another. Saving it for when he needs it, if we need it. Yeah, and I think. I think there was a, there was a lad by me yesterday who said I think he's the best of our forward players. I think he's the best defensively at the moment. I think it's hard. I think it's hard to disagree with that. I think he, he's he's up and down that line. He's, he's supporting his fullback. I think Salah has a bit of a different role. I think Salah's told to cheat a bit more and stay back and and things. But I think I think in terms of in terms of what he's done, I think I think we can be arsed. I think me and you had the chat in the summer Neil about him scoring more goals. They're, the goal yesterday is the goals I wanted them to score. Exactly those ones. Yeah. Goals I, want. I, don't, I, don't, I don't care about them putting it in from 25, 30 yards yeah. because you're not going to do that every week. Whereas them goals are what Mane scored under that. He's for got Liverpool. a lot this season, hasn't he? He's got a lot of those. You think of Luton, 12, 13. Luton. Yeah. In all confidence. 13, but he's got but a lot of, them a lot of those unit. six yeah. yard box goals. And you, know, you think of Chelsea on the first Thursday yeah. of the season sliding in. Like, dude, he, he has, he, I think he needed to do that a lot. Like, I mean, I know he. He lost a lot of last season with injury, didn't he? So it was a bit harsh, and I think there was a period where he come back, and it was sort of like, "Oh, Luis Diaz is back," and it's like, ah, "He's not, he's not quite there yet." But fair enough, he's had a knee injury. Um, that was the one thing I, I wanted to see from him. I thought I, I agree completely with Paddy about when he came in. I think I don't want to say anyone could have done it, but it's like, well, you go and look at this team; it's amazing. Like, there you go. We'll just drop you in, and you can just enjoy yourself. Uh, I, th- I I did think once Mane left, I thought right, we'll see, we'll see Diaz, like we'll see how good he is. You know, is he is he a Mane replacement? I still think he can get better. I still think he can have more sort of um, what's the word? Just reliability in terms of his, his end product. But you look at it, 
what, 30, is it 13 goals this season? Fair few assists, yep. big goals. You know, he doesn't doesn't often score two in a game, does he? Just get just gets one, but he often gets equalizers or, or, equalizers or, or crucial or ones. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think he's he's not doing a bad job, is he? And you know, I think it says a lot that we talk a lot about Liverpool's forward options. He's always in, isn't he? Mm. He's always on that. Like, he's he's pretty much nailed in. It's really, to be honest, I think the, the only question is sort of who plays down the middle, isn't it? Salah Sal- Sal- and Diaz are, are locked in with Klopp. Yeah, I, I really like him. I, I like his honesty. And we talked a lot about you know players' attitudes as well as talents. You know, in, in this and it's it's throughout the squad, and that's why they get bought, isn't it? If we're honest with you, but you know, it's, I, I really like his application and, and you know how, how much he puts of himself in into games. And, and like Neil said, when we really needed it a few a few weeks ago or you know a month or so ago, you, you felt like it, you know he almost redoubled his efforts. Really, I think there is more to come, and I think you know. You know, the manager, I'm sure, or the next manager will, will be looking to sort of, you know, get get even more out of him, really, because you feel like, you know, like like Paddy said before, there is times where you like just back yourself a little bit more there and, and things like that. But you feel like there is more to come with him. But he's been a warrior, I think. You know, last last couple of months and different people have stepped up at different times and in the season, and, and that's what partly is what made it so special and partly why we are still going for so much. But, you know, he's been a massive part of where we are and, and gets big goals, and that was a big one he's yesterday because the longer it, we were playing well and we were creating chances, but the longer it goes on, it does get nervy, but he got it at a good time yesterday and he's done that, like Neil says, a few times this season. Um, Van Dijk, then we mentioned before about him coming all the way into midfield, John. Uh, because the, but In part because they had a Van Dijk plan. Uh, it was really interesting to me. Obviously, Moses' job, one of his key things was stop Van Dijk from playing, which is a mad thing to think about your centre-half. Did that you was, see the stat? Uh, no, go so on. Passes. So Van Dijk had 50 touches. I think Quantz had 110. Yeah, so like, that's unbelievable for two centre backs. Yeah, so that's that, that, but that's what they were doing. They were saying that they did not want Liverpool to play through Van Dijk. I just think again, though, he he just leads by example all the way through the match. I think in his in his defending work that he does there, it, it, it's the business all the way through. Uh, I thought he was, I genuinely thought he was excellent without getting to do some of what at times you go, oh my god, Virgil Van Dijk is so good. Yeah. No, he's he's been phenomenal this year, and he's gone up another level. And I didn't think that was possible because he was, you know, you're already talking him of one of the best centre halves we've ever had, the best, you know, Premier League era, perhaps, you know. And and he's gone up another level, and it is that leadership, it is that what he's doing in games, you know, how he's, you know, taking it upon himself. You know, we've talked a lot about responsibility and players taking responsibility, and he's done that. I think at the end of the season, there's a really interesting thing to be to be made about Virgil where I'd love to speak to his teammates and just say like what has he been like as a leader you know what has he been like in the dressing room what has he been saying before games you know is he just reading his programme notes out because they're pretty good or is he you know, I'm, I'm sure he's sort of saying other things like I, I, what changes uh, Darwin have you read this <laughs> what, what, what changes have you seen you know in Virgil sort of because you know the captaincy is an interesting thing and listen he was already a leader in the team because he's Virgil van Dijk isn't he but you know getting that armband and what that's done to him and you know you can't just you know one minute be one fella and then the next minute be like right I've got the armband so I've got to do you know people see through that but yeah. it's been gradual throughout the season isn't it? you've just seen more and more of him on the pitch and I wouldn't be surprised if you know if, if they do win, win the title then then there will be you know some interesting conversations I'm hoping hard with sorts of players about you know what have you seen from Virgil how have you seen him grow you know what confidence does he put in you because I think that's a massive thing as well you know the confidence he puts in his teammates and, and how they feel it's, it's almost sort of Klopp-esque really I think and, but he's been he's been phenomenal you know this season and he's really watching you know you, you're watching one of the very best I think to have played the game I, I I wonder on that, John, if if, if a lot of the players are you, you class as leaders for the last however five, six, seven years or so, had that much respect for Henderson and Milner that well, not not that they want to step on any toes, but I think they seen them too as and respected them so much. They were like, well, I've got a certain role to play in this squad, and and they and they're the two, they're the, they're the two, they're the two captains, and I think. Like you said, if he completely changed personality, players would see through it. I think he's just he's just he's just stepped up what he was probably already doing anyway, and thought this is my team now, and I'm gonna I'm gonna mould it in, in in the shape of me. And I think I know we touched on loads about, about in the game, and I'm, and I'm coming out and pressing, which you know wasn't like him. I, I wondered I wondered that time yesterday if that was a bit of him saying like this is what we need to do, this is how aggressive we need to be, more more so to tell his teammates rather than you know more more, than, more so than tactically than than anything. I think I think you might have thought. There was, t- there was times maybe we weren't getting stuck in enough and he thought this is how aggressive I'm going to be and this, this is usually the match and I think all season he's just 
he's, he's been immaculate and, he, and, he's, and, he's, and he's led by example. And I think it's, it's no surprise players have stepped up the way they have when they're seeing a player who they've played with for years be that good and then go up another level again. I think I think he's been, he's, he's been unbelievable. I think you know in in a, in a Liverpool career where he's had so many standout seasons. I think I think this could be the one. And I think if they go on and do what we want them to do, it you know it is title, isn't it? He 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 he's dragged this team towards, and I think you know, he'd, he'd look good with that trophy. <laughs> <laughs> he certainly would. Trophy. It's, it's very symbolic, isn't it? As well, I think him being the captain, but. All the doubts about Liverpool were all the doubts about Virgil van Dijk, weren't yeah. they? And, and, and they've all been answered. And you, I think they were answered very early in the season as well. I, I remember, I know he had the red card at Newcastle, but there was a couple of games early on. I think even Chelsea on the first game of the season, I thought, oh, van Dijk looks looks good. And I thought, right, that's a good sign. And I think almost that is, a, I think, for the manager, but for the teammates, it's like, oh, we're all right here. Like, he's, he's back, this type of thing, and that means we are. So, I think... I agree with John. I think it was it's telling, wasn't it? You know, he he brought in the huddle before the kick off. Yeah. You see, you see the the impact he takes with referees. Get out, get out of his way. There was, there was a few yesterday where it looked like someone was going to get chinned, and and he he was like, just go away, and I'll just sort it. And people go, all right, you know, my dad will sort that out. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's a bit like that, isn't it? And including David Coote at times. Yeah. But there was, there was yeah. a yeah. brilliant one where yeah, he was going to get chinned. Yeah, but Van Dijk and Lewis they were going mad about Diaz's goal, mm. saying he was offside and, and they were surrounding him. And then Virgil got onto it and he was I like, "I'm going to go over and sort this." One. And he only got halfway, and then yeah. he just. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was like you going to get your dad coming up the stairs yeah. and he just sort of stopped. Yeah, yeah. He only got halfway, and then he, yeah. then he just like went, "Let's just fucking let's yeah. disperse quickly." He's he's. He's been he's been immense in a, in a season where we can talk at length about player after player after player after player. He's the one, isn't he, that stands above them all. Okay, I want to talk about Sheffield United, obviously. Uh, I'll get used to pick for your team because that's the job. Uh, not necessarily of any of you. Uh, I think <laughs> Jurgen Klopp's the man with ultimate responsibility. Uh, I'll sort of pick a bit of a team and by all means disagree. Um, Kelleher in goal, Bradley, Canate, Van Dijk, um, Endo, McAllister, Sabozlai, Salah. Nunez, for me, I think all those play. Is that fair? I wonder if you might do something at left back because there's the opportunity to give to give Gomez a bit of a rest. We don't know where Robertson's up to. Mighty thing about using this as an opportunity to get some get a start into Gakpo uh, against the side where he might be able to build a bit of confidence. Elliot, um, and will Mighty think about throwing Elliot in from the start? Mighty think I've got five subs here. You know, there might be a bit of 45-45 or 60-30. What do you think he's going to do? Any I, I'd, I'd like to see him start Gakpo. I think Gakpo could do with the start. I think, you know, you're throwing him on at the end of the games. and It's not always games that suit him. I don't think, like, you know, yesterday he was getting a bit of stick by us when he came on because he's... he's <laughs> He, you know, fucking wrong Gakpo and stuff like that. He's not that sort. He's not a fella yeah, to come on, game, and yeah. he's not. He's not going to add intensity. You know, he's going to add a little also bit of. Also, just his calm. general gait yeah, doesn't help yeah. with that. Like he can be yeah. running a fair bit, yeah. but he just doesn't look like like Harvey Eddie. It looks like he really runs. Yeah, and Gakpo looks like he jogs. Yeah, and so I, I'd, I'd pick Gakpo and I'd put Nunes on the bench because. I'd, I'd, I think it, oh, right, okay. it's, it's a nice yeah, opportunity to do well. that, and I and I like Nunes off the bench as well. There's been times where, you know, Nunes has started, and I was like, oh, I'd love to bring Nunes on now. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you can bring another Nunes for that for that time. I thought he was quiet at the weekend, um, Nunes, and I don't know whether that's sort of, you know, you know what that was. You know, sometimes you could just have a quiet day, and you can look too much into it, can't you? But but I just wonder whether I would just take him out for this one, and, and you tell him now you're starting at Old Trafford. Yeah. But I'm going to play Gakpo in this one. Play Diaz and Salah either side. I think Salah plays all three because he's it was obviously at the, the the break. And I think you ask you ask Diaz to go again. But I think that's a three where you know there's goals in that three. And then if you you've got Nunes on the bench on 60, if you know he, heaven forbid it, it is sort of going a bit off. So so I'd be looking to do that and also maybe looking at the midfield and saying, well, is this a game where you could give one one of Endo or McAllister a rest and either drop Endo out and, and play McAllister a little bit deeper and then look to get either Elliot or Gravenberg in. Gravenberg, you know, it's been a while since he Curtis. started the game. Yeah, Curtis, Curtis is, 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 is an option. And so I'd be looking to use the opportunity again because because both Endo and McAllister are playing their old Trafford. They're both playing yeah. answer boss life realistically. That that three will play, will play Sunday, you would have thought. So so get an opportunity to give one of those, you know, a bit of a breather as as well makes sense to me. And you get Canati back him if you can. Yeah, I think on Gakpo it wouldn't surprise me if he just says you're getting you're getting next Thursday. Um I think leading the line for Liverpool. And, and, and Thursday's gonna be massive. I know I know it's only Sheffield United but that but the crowd will be absolutely bouncing going instead, you know, we've got we've got this lead now. 
I think I think I think sometimes you know over the years when we've thought about games like this and what changes do you make, it wouldn't surprise me if you just if you, if you name most of your team, which was is, isn't many changes at all, just Canate coming in um, from yesterday. I think I don't know. I just I don't think Gakpo is obviously. I, I'm not as, I'm not as down on him as other people are. I think he'll be fine. I think he's Same. actually quite a, quite a good season if you look at his goals and the games he's played in and things like that. But I just think leading the line for Liverpool in a game where we obviously need to win. I can see how that could possibly go wrong or people could get on his back a little bit if things don't go too well and I think I just think we always look better with Nunes in the team I'd take John's point about how he's, he's, he's come on in a lot of games and made a real difference but I just think if you start him and when we have the game won by 60 minutes then, you then, take then, it, then it's time for others and you know they've got, they've got to be playing at a, 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 you know two games a week now from, from now to the end and I think he likes to get them in that rhythm doesn't he so it, I, 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 I wouldn't surprise me if there's not too many changes and I think I'd, I'd, I'd be all for Keeping it relatively similar with it, with an iron winning the game and then getting some of them off before next week. And Karate is an interesting one because he hasn't played as he for Liverpool for five, four or five games. Yeah. I think he, he had the game against for France, but I sort of won him at Old Trafford. Yeah. And but then a, the Thursday night, I think, can you play both of them? You know, is, is it one of them where you maybe you, you 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 try and sort of manage it and go let's let's give him an hour and take in quarter off or or vice versa. I think that, that that's a, t- a tough one because I, I think I think he is obviously he is the centre back alongside Van Dijk, but it's really difficult at the moment with his fitness, isn't it? That he's just he's, there's just that uncertainty about him, and I can't work out what I want. And the balance is: do I want him to have a game, or do I want him sort of yeah. safe and 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 ready for Old Trafford? I will play Gakpo for for the reason that John, John said. I think. The opposition obviously lends itself to you're going to be on top of the game anyway, so it's not one where you're going to have to sort of, you know, you don't you're not have to push them back. To you the don't think you're going to be quiet. Um, but also, if if worst happens and it's not one, and I, I think Nunes ignites something in, in in the crowd in the second half, as opposed to if you had Nunes on the pitch and you wouldn't break through and you've got Gakpo's, you sub, it's a little bit like, like, is that going to. Are you going to want to turn to that? I think Nunes is a great option in a game like that off the bench. And if you don't need him, even better, you can you can just you know put him in the cage and get him ready for Sunday. Okay, excellent stuff. Thank you very much to Neil, to John, and to Paddy. Uh, Liverpool find themselves top of the league. Nine games to go. Absolutely perfect stuff. See you later.